Hi, uh, welcome to the last lecture of the first day of the summer school. And it is my pleasure to introduce um, uh, Jose Miguel Hernandez Lobata, who is a professor of machine learning at the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge. And he's also the director for the Ellis Unit at Cambridge. So uh, thank you for being here. Good, uh, great. Thanks uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, today I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, deep generative models and the applications of these methods to solve some uh, real world problems. Um, first of all, I want to start by a definition of a generative model, uh, a deep generative model. And in this case, we are going to be working with neural networks. The neural networks are going to receive some uh, tractable noise as input. This is going to be, for example, Gaussian noise uh, or any other distribution that is easy to sample from or evaluate densities or uh, doing any other task that we might be uh, needing. We're going to have then a neural network that is going to process uh, that noise and it's going to generate some uh, more complicated random variables generating some uh, approximate distribution at the output. And uh, in many cases, we will want this uh, complicated distribution to fit a particular target distribution, which could be, for example, the data distribution or any other distribution that we might be interested in uh, working with. Um, you can fit them by optimizing the parameters of your neural network, and then once you have trained these models, you could do things like evaluating the density. For example, you may have only access to the data, but you don't have access to the data density, and maybe you want to, to have that. Uh, you could evaluate the density of this approximate distribution given by the generative model. Or you could just uh, generate IID data. Um, they have actually many useful applications, and uh, today, uh, we are going to tell you a bit about different ways in which uh, deep generative models can be used uh, in real world applications, uh, specifically with some connection with the uh, healthcare and uh, biology. Uh, today I'm going to tell you about some work that I have been doing in my group in these areas. You could use deep generative models, for example, to impute and acquire missing data in uh, a particular data set. You may have a data set with missing data, and uh, this could be, for example, for a patient in a hospital. You may have access only to some symptoms of the patient, and you may want what disease the patient has. And uh, you may want to collect data for that patient to do some tests, to collect some measurements, so that you find fast what disease the patient has. In this case, we want to collect missing data uh, efficiently, and you can actually do that using deep generative models, and we are going to see how to do that. You can also use deep generative models to find new molecules with the improved properties, for example, to design better drugs um, or better materials. We are going to see how to use deep generative models to generate new molecules, but knowing how to synthesize those molecules in practice. I'm going to describe here today some synthesis-aware deep generative models of molecules that will output new molecules, but also telling you how to synthesize those molecules in practice. Another example of how deep generative models can be useful is for uh, robust predictions. Um, in many data sets, you may have the spurious correlations, the spurious dependencies in your data. This happens, for example, in healthcare. Many times, if you have data from different hospitals, this data may have been collected under different biased processes that can introduce these spurious correlations. You may want to build robust predictors that don't use spurious correlations that don't hold, for example, in data from a different hospital, and you can do that using deep generative models as I will, I will be showing you today. Finally, another interesting application of uh, deep generative models is to approximate the Boltzmann distribution of molecules. Molecules are not really rigid objects. You have that the atoms, they can uh, vibrate and oscillate in space, and uh, they will be occupying different locations with different probabilities, and you may want to approximate these probabilities. Uh, this can be very useful, for example, in drug design. You may have a particular drug-like molecule, and you may want to know if it's going to bind to a target protein. 
you may want to approximate the probability distribution that the drug-like drug molecule uh, can follow in, in a space and know how likely it is that maybe it's attached in a particular binding site that you care about. Um, you can build degenerative models and approximate that distribution and that could be useful to, to estimate it, for example, the, the binding affinity of, of uh, drug-like molecules. We're going to see all these applications in this tutorial, but before that, I'm going to give a brief uh, introduction to some uh, simple ways to construct deep generative models. I'm going to focus on variational autoencoders and normalizing flows. Uh, those are the models that I'm going to be using in these applications. Before I start here, I want to know more or less who is familiar with variational autoencoders, who has seen variational autoencoders before. Okay, some people have seen this, but maybe only half or so. Uh, could I, I'm going to just cover the basics to understand the material. Uh, variational autoencoders, they are deep generative models, as I mentioned before, that they take some uh, tractable distribution like Gaussian and they uh, use a neural network to map it into a more complicated distribution uh, with the thing that the tractable distribution is going to be on some low dimensional variables uh, set. These are going to be some latent variables, they have low dimension, and they kind of summarize the main patterns and regularities in the data. Then you use a big neural network. Once you sample, for example, your latent variable set from a tractable distribution, a Gaussian, you're going to use a big neural network to map those variables into a higher uh, dimensional space, X. And this is typically done with a Gaussian conditional distribution. Uh, whose parameters are given by a neural network. So you have set, then you have a big neural network that maps uh, set into uh, some Gaussians for uh, the data point X. You may have like a factorized Gaussian, the means and the variances of this Gaussian on X are a function of set, uh, and typically X is much higher dimensional. Uh, you see an example here uh, where you may have Gaussians in this low dimensional latent space and you have a neural network that maps those Gaussians into conditional um, Gaussians as well on X, but that are much, much higher dimensional. Uh, by the way, on these uh, slides, I, uh, there's a lot of work on deep generative models available online, and I followed uh, some uh, material by uh, Jacob uh, Tomstack. He has an amazing book on deep generative models, and I recommend anyone that wants to know more about this to, to follow that book. Good, so you just have this model, it's a hierarchical model, you have a Gaussian prior on the latent variables set, and then you uh, sample the, the data uh, from some conditional distribution given the latent variables. You can obtain the probability of the data using the same rule of probability. You just multiply the prior on set and the the likelihood, uh, the probability of X given Z, and then integrate Z out, and then you just get this uh, probability of X. No, this is just the probability of X here. Okay, and this thing here is just the, the probability of X and Z. So I'm just using the sum rule uh, to eliminate the hidden variables. This is just uh, eliminating hidden variables in the model. Good. Uh, you want to learn these models by maximum likelihood. Computing the likelihood is intractable because you have to solve that integral. You have to solve this integral here that is intractable. So you need to do some approximations and what you can do is to obtain a lower bound to the likelihood. This is often called the elbow, evidence lower bound. And this derived as, as easy as, as follows. Uh, you just uh, multiply by this thing which is just equal to one, so I'm not changing my integral. I just have introduced this distribution Q, it's an auxiliary distribution that uh, is going to approximate the posterior on the hidden variables. Um, you can then write this here, this, the integral of the ratio of Q with itself times these terms, you can write it as an expectation over samples from Q, which we have here. And then now what I am computing the expectation of is this ratio between the joint of X and Z and Q. So, so far I just rewrote things. 
And then here we use uh, Jensen's inequality to obtain a lower bound. And you can do that because the log is a, a concave function. The log is a function like this. And then any points that you connect in this function, they are going to be, uh, any points that you connect to a straight line, they are going to be under the log. And uh, it's very easy to show that if you get your log inside of the expectation, here you will get a lower bound. And that's uh, what you call the elbow. This is the elbow in your variation of the encoder model. And uh, the interesting thing now is that um, you don't need to solve this very high dimensional integral. You just need to take this expectation with respect to samples from Q. And this expectation, you can approximate it by Monte Carlo very easily. And you can then optimize this quantity using a stochastic optimization. You just get a noisy estimate of the objective of this elbow uh, by averaging over some samples from Q. And then you just do a stochastic uh, optimization to, uh, to optimize Q. You will have to, to find these parameters uh, phi. Q could be Gaussian with some means and some variances. And then you just optimize the, the means and the variances of your Gaussian. Um, you can also optimize with respect to P as well. P is going to have some parameters and you could also optimize uh, those parameters. And then that's how you learn the model. The model is this new neural network that maps the, the Gaussian noise on, on, on set into a distribution over X and it's going to have some parameters. Good. Um, in practice, you have to do that for every single data point X. Every single data point X is going to have a, an approximate distribution Q and then solving that for each data point is going to be too expensive. So what you can do is to use something called amortized inference. And the idea is that now Q is going to depend on X so, uh, so that we receive the data point X and then we just find the mean and the variance parameters in Q um, without having to do any optimization. You have a neural network. It's called this encoder that gives you the parameters uh, for the means and the variances on, on the latent variable set. Um, and you just optimize that network. So you just have your encoder and decoder model. The decoder gets Gaussian samples from set and maps that, in, maps that into a Gaussian distribution for X. And then the encoder gets X as input and maps that into a Gaussian distribution for uh, set. Um, and you just then optimize your elbow over all the data. Now you have here a sum of terms, uh, one per data point. Uh, you are going to do a Monte Carlo approximation of this expectation by averaging over some samples uh, of the latent variables. And then you use something called the reparameterization trick to be able to differentiate through the samples of set. Uh, you are going to be sampling from, sampling set from the variational distribution Q. And then you want to optimize also the parameters of Q. You want to optimize these parameters phi of your encoder. And to do that, you need to compute the full, the, you, you need to compute the gradients of your Monte Carlo estimate of the, of the elbow. Um, and that requires to differentiate the samples of set with respect to the parameters of your encoder. And you can do that by using this reparameterization trick. The idea is to uh, write a sample from the variational distribution Q in terms of the mean of my variational distribution that depends on the parameters of my encoder and its uh, variance. Here is the standard deviation. Um, and then we have here epsilon, which is some uh, standard Gaussian noise. So now Z, my sample Z, depends on the parameters of my encoder and I can actually compute gradients. Um, so if you have a standard Gaussian like this, epsilon is sampled from a standard Gaussian, you can transform that sample into a sample from any Gaussian with a particular mean and variance by using this uh, reparameterization trick. Any questions so far on this? It's clear? 
Good. Um, so that's great. Operational auto encoders have been applied in many domains. They work very well, but they can get even better by using hierarchical variational auto encoders. And the idea is that you don't have just one single layer of uh, latent variables, but you have many layers. Uh, you are going to have maybe a Gaussian prior on the top level latent variables, and then given those uh, uh, latent variables, now you generate the second level of latent variables in the same way as you were generating the data in the model that we saw before. And now given, given this uh, level of uh, latent variables, then you put a condition on them and then generate the data. So it's just like a multi-step process where you just have like, you could think of, of this as being a smaller variation of encoder models and just concatenate one after the other. Um, you can do inference, again, with a recognition network. And there are, there are different ways in which you could do this. Uh, there are some works that I mentioned here in the bottom that describe how to implement this to work well in practice. Uh, the idea is that uh, your recognition network is going to have some deterministic components. And the recognition network reduces uh, the decoder network. For example, if I want to, I observe X, imagine that I observe X and I want to obtain my posterior, my approximate posterior on the latent variables. What I'm going to use is to use these uh, recognition nodes here that are deterministic and they are going to de determine some uh, changes to the means and the variances in my decoder. These are deterministic. And then what I have now is that I add these uh, changes to the means and the variances of my decoder network. So here I would have the prior, and now the prior is going to change. The mean is going to be translated uh, in the prior by some quantity, and the variance is going to be scaled. And then that's how I obtain my variational distribution for this level. Then I sample these latent variables for the top level. And given those, and given these uh, delta parameters, I can then sample the, the next level. And uh, given these this, uh, conditional variables, uh, these variables set one, then I can sample, I mean, I, I would be then, then done. That's, that's basically a way of generating samples from my encoder. I just uh, use this deterministic uh, path that then tells me how to change my decoder to obtain an approximate posterior. And then you have that the, the encoder and the decoder, they are coupled. Uh, and this actually improves training quite a lot. Um, and you can see here some nice samples from these uh, hierarchical VAEs. They generate very high quality samples um, from a data set of uh, photographs of celebrities. Good, these are VAEs. Any question on this? Good. Uh, the other model that I want to talk about is uh, normalizing flows. Normalizing flows is a different way of generating uh, complicated uh, probability distributions. And the idea is, uh, as I mentioned before, you start with a simple distribution. This could be a uniform distribution on the unit um, square, for example, or it could be just Gaussians. And what you are going to do is to do a deterministic invertible transformation of those variables, and then you are going to get a new set of variables. For example, if we start with X, we end up with a new set of variables Y, and because you are transforming the variables, the density, the distribution of the, of the, the variables is going to change as well. Here we are just stretching the input uh, space, and the density is changing, no? Uh, the density changes because you have to have constant probability mass. So if I have this region here, this region is going to be mapped into a wider region in this space. And obviously the two have to integrate the same so that probability mass is preserved. Um, and this basically gives you an idea of how to obtain now the density of the transformed variables just by, by following this rule of preserving probability mass. So if you are at a particular point in the uh, input space x, and then you make like a small change of that variable, 
uh, the probability mass corresponding to to that to that region has to be the same as the probability mass uh, in the uh, transformed space. Uh, doing this, you can then solve for the density of y. You can solve for this, and uh, you obtain the following formula. Now you just have that the uh, probability mass is preserved, and then you can just uh, divide differential of x by differential of y. You will get this. This is just uh, the derivative of x as a function of uh, y. Um, you know that that's the the inverse of the the inverse the inverse of the derivative of the inverse function. Uh, so you can divide by the the derivative of y uh, with respect to x. And uh, if you take logs, this gives you now the formula for the density of the transformed variables. You have that. Um, the log density of the transformed variables is just the log density of the original variables. This would be, for example, the log of a Gaussian, if I use Gaussian-based variables. And then I have an extra term here, which is the log of uh, this uh, absolute value of, of how much uh, um, y changes as a function of x. You need to take this absolute value because uh, this derivative can be negative. Um, this thing can be negative, and obviously if you want to have a valid density here, p of x is positive, and then uh, the derivative, uh, what, what you are dividing for, it should be positive as well to, to give you like positive densities. Um, so that's why you need to take the, the absolute value. It's just how the volume of the region changes as you change uh, from x to y. Uh, and that's going to be given by this absolute value. You can do exactly the same thing in higher dimensions, and instead of working with just the derivative of x as a function of y, you will be working with something called the Jacobian of your invertible transformation f. The Jacobian is just a matrix with the derivatives of the outputs of uh, f. You will have, like, if you have multiple variables, you have, um, um, you, you have m multiple dimensions in x, and that's what going to be, those are going to be mapped into multiple dimensions in Y. Um, and you have this Jacobian matrix that tells you how each dimension, the first dimension of X, changes as a function of all the other, uh, uh, the first dimension of, of F changes as a function of uh, the different uh, dimensions in X, and so on. And the change in volume by doing this transformation is then given by the determinant of this Jacobian, which is related to the area of uh, this parallelogram. Now, um, when you do these small changes in the variables by, by moving a differential uh, amount in each of the dimensions, then you have that uh, um, a square like this is going to map into a parallelogram, and you can compute the area of this parallelogram very easily with uh, this determinant of the Jacobian. Good. Uh, so now you just have the equation for the density of the transformed variables. Uh, it's just uh, the original density, and then it has this log determinant term for the Jacobian. So when you build these normalizing flows, you are going to be interested in looking for invertible transformations that have a, an easy to uh, compute Jacobian, that are easy to compute and they have like a Jacobian uh, determinant, a determinant of a Jacobian that is uh, tractable. Um, because of this, you will have to use some simple nonlinear transformations that have these properties, but you can stack many of these one after the other. So if you have simple uh, transformations with uh, Jacobians whose determinant is easy to compute, you may stack many, and then in the end you get like a quite complicated transformation. And this is actually what you do in normalizing flows. What type of transformations you can use? There are many different choices. I will describe here one that is quite widely used, which is coupling layers. And the idea is that you, um, if you have some variable x, you are going to divide that into some uh, part of its uh, components, x a, and uh, xb, and then uh, the same with y. You are going to have y a and then y b. And x actually could be 
in fact, having many coordinates, x2 up to xd, uh, and you just have that uh, xa is uh, a subset of those. For example, xa could be uh, x1, x2, and then xb could be x3, uh, x4. So you just partition your, your variables, and you're going to do now some simple transformations where uh, some of the variables, half of them, they won't be changed, and the other ones, they will be scaled and uh, translated uh, uh, as a function of the, the other ones, no? So you have that yb is obtained as a function of uh, xa um, by uh, taking xb and scaling them as a function of xa and translating them. And the key thing is that the Jacobian that you obtain, in this case, is tractable. And it's just given by this product of, of the scaling constants that you use uh, here. Good. Um, any questions so far on this? Yes. Um, this would be a yeah, very good question. This would be functions given by a neural network. So you're going to have a neural network uh, giving you some functions. Uh, they will, this will have some parameters, for example, uh, theta, and uh, you will be learning this uh, by, for example, maximum likelihood. Good. So there are many different applications of flows. This shows an example of how flows can be used, again, to generate like high quality uh, synthetic data that looks quite similar to, to original data. Good, so that's a brief introduction to these models. Now I'm going to tell you how you can use these models to uh, solve some uh, real world problems. And as I said, we're going to focus on missing data acquisition, finding uh, optimal molecules with uh, synthetic roots, robust prediction, and approximating both band distributions. Let's start with uh, missing data acquisition. This is something that happens in many settings, imagine that uh, you may have to make predictions uh, based on uh, missing data. So you may have like data, a data set with missing data and you may want to make predictions about some property of interest when you have this missing data. And you may be also interested in collecting missing data to improve your predictions. And an example is here for predicting the price of a house. I may want to know what is the, the estimate, uh, for example, of of a house that someone is selling, but I don't know yet anything about that house. I may want to ask now, oh, what is the location of the house? Uh, does it have a garage? How many square meters does the house have? What's the, does it have a driveway? What's the size of the garden and so on? And I can ask the user about this information, um, but maybe providing all this information could be expensive to the user. And I may want to make predictions that are accurate fast. Uh, and I want to ask the user about the most relevant information. Uh, the same thing happens in healthcare. I may have a patient that is sick and I may need to do some tests uh, to diagnose the patient with a particular disease. I may want to collect the most useful information first. Uh, this uh, efficient collection of missing data can actually be solved with deep generative models. Uh, this this same problem appears in many different settings in insurance, uh, when you people do online surveys uh, for recommender systems uh, and so on. So, yes. Uh, this is active learning. This is active learning actually, but at the instance level. Typically you do active learning uh, on a particular model. You say, I have this model, I want to now collect uh, labeled data points. I want to learn fast based on those labeled data points. Here, you just have a particular example. You are interested in predicting one of the properties of that example, the target, and you just do active learning at the feature level to improve your predictions. So it's like active learning, but instead of uh, at the, 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 the example level, where you label examples, here is at the feature level, where you collect uh, features. Good, so imagine that you have now this feature vector with some observed variables in blue and some missing variables in red. 
and then you may want to make predictions about a particular variable that is missing. Uh, we are going to call this uh, x phi, and this is going to be the target variable. Uh, it's going to be a scalar, but it could also be a vector. Um, so this could be the tenth variable in this case. And now I want to collect a new missing variable, one of those in, uh, in red, that gives me as much information about the target, uh, this x10 variable, given the observed variables. You can do this by choosing the missing variable that is most informative about the target property. Um, you can actually quantify the amount of information that a particular missing uh, variable xi gives you about the target x phi in the context of some observed variables and it's given by this um, pullback library divergence between conditional distributions. This looks at how much my current prediction, this would be my current prediction on the target, the probability of the target given the observed variables, this is kind of my state of knowledge of the target and now I assume that I observe this uh, missing variable xi and I get an updated predictive distribution and I can see how much that changes from the original one that's quantified by the Kullback library divergence and obviously I don't know the value of the missing variable that I would be obtaining but I could sample from it and compute an average with respect to my predictive distribution for the missing variable. This is basically the mutual information Actually, this is the mutual information between my missing variable xi and the target. And you are just uh, wanting to collect data that is highly dependent on the target. And that's, that's, that's going to be the variable that gives you the most, uh, the highest amount of information. So if you want to solve this problem in practice, you need to be able to compute these quantities. And to do that, you need these conditionals. You need like the conditional distributions that appear here, the, con the marginal for the conditional marginal for xi, the conditional marginal for the target, and then this conditional uh, for the target given the, the missing variable. Um, so you need these conditional distributions, and they are arbitrary, and to do that, you will need a generative model for your data. You will have a model that actually generates all the data. Um, we are going to use a variational autoencoder for this. <laughs> Uh, so the idea is that you will have your data set, this could be a table with uh, missing entries. You are going to fit a variational autoencoder to this data, and then you are going to use the resulting model to compute these uh, uh, mutual information values. And it's going to give you um, measurements about what variables are most informative for collecting this data. Any questions so far on this? Uh, no? Good. So this sounds great. The first thing is, can you actually train a variational autoencoder with missing data? Uh, if you have missing data, to train the variational autoencoder, you need the conditional probability of the observed data given the data and variables. And actually, because in the fully observed model, this distribution is a factorized Gaussian, whose means and variances depend on the data and variables, you can actually integrate this very easily. You just throw away the missing variables and you just look at the, uh, the Gaussians on the observed variables. So it's like taking the likelihood of your variational autoencoder model and evaluating it only on the observed data. That's very easy. Um, and you can just uh, replace the full data likelihood with this missing data likelihood only on the observed values. So that's a straightforward. The only problem is that now your encoder network is conditioned only on the observed data, and the observed data is going to be different for different data plots. And this creates a problem because encoders in variational autoencoder models, they are not designed to handle missing data. Uh, I won't go much into the details of this, but to solve this problem, what we propose is uh, something called a partial encoder. And the idea is that you encode the set of observed features as a set using something called set encoding uh, methods. They are used in deep learning quite widely. The idea is that you are going to encode now the observed features here. 
you may have a set of observed features, you have now an embedding of those features given by these variables, E1, E2, EI, this is the embedding for the first variable, for the second, for the i variable, and then you have the feature value, uh, X, this is the associated feature value, and uh, you just uh, embed those through a neural network, H, into some representation of the observed features, and then you just sum all those representations. And this sum operation is a, a permutation invariant operation, and it allows you to, to create an embedding of a set of uh, data points. This is widely used in deep learning. It's called the set encoding methods. Uh, people have used this in, in computer vision settings, and they are co it's called point net. Uh, so we use these methods to, to create uh, encoders that receive as input the set of observed features. And you can show that those encoders perform better than other simpler things, like for example, doing zero uh, imputing. If you have, for example, missing data, you just say this is zero. Uh, that's a very simple approach, but this thing uh, works better. Um, there is another way of how to compute this information gain, but I think because I don't have a lot of time, uh, I won't go into the details. The key thing is that the information gain, the mutual information between the missing variables that you could collect and the target that you want to predict, you can evaluate that efficiently in variation of encoder models. And it only involves working with Gaussians in your encoder networks. I won't go much into the details of this because I don't have time, but you have like a simple way to estimate this mutual information by Monte Carlo. Uh, the details are here, but uh, uh, I will share the slides to you later and, and you can look at it. Good. Um, one final detail to create our model. Um, one thing is that when you train variation autoencoders to images, they work great, as the, the examples I showed with the celebrity faces. Uh, what happens is that when you train variation autoencoders on tabular data, tabular data, each dimension can have complicated margins with different uh, types. You could have discrete variables, continuous, positive only, categorical variables, and so on. And that can create problems if you train a variational autoencoder model with Gaussian decoders, with a Gaussian decoder. We solve that problem by fitting something called marginal decoders. These are now marginal variational autoencoders. They are 1D variational autoencoder models that map the original data into Gaussian latent variables. And now when you have trained these marginal variation autoencoders one per each dimension, you can then encode your data, and that encoded data is having Gaussian marginals because you specify those models to have Gaussian latent variables. So now your data, it doesn't matter what type of data it is, if it is continuous, uh, this discrete, positive only or so, you encode the data with these marginal decoders and you have now data that has Gaussian marginals. And that's going to be much better described by a variation autoencoder model with a Gaussian decoder. And that's what we use here in this dependency network. Um, this thing here, the dependency network, is just a Gaussian uh, variation autoencoder model. Good. Um, so let's have a look at how this works in practice with an example. This is with the Boston housing data set. Uh, we call our method the uh, EDI. Um, and uh, the idea here is that we have now features for uh, the prices of, uh, for features for a house and then also the price here. And this is the variable of interest. We haven't, we haven't observed any variable yet. And we want to make predictions about the, the, pri the price of a house of a particular person. We haven't seen any of these features yet. And we have here the information gain for the different features. This axis here is the information gain, the higher, the more informative. And then we are going to choose the next feature to collect from the user by maximizing this quantity. This is the most informative feature. It has this, in, in purple, I show the, the amount of information. And we're going to observe that feature. We have observed the feature now. We got this value. 
and now our prediction on the price has changed. It has become uh, narrow, our predictive distribution, and now we can, uh, again, given the observed var value, we can try to ask which is the, the next most informative feature. And uh, I think it's going to be this one, probably. I don't know, these two, these two are quite informative. Uh, we choose the one that is the, the most informative one, and we will observe that one. We choose that one, and then we get a new data point, which is this one. And we see how the marginal distributions, these are violin plots, they show the marginal distribution for the, the missing features. We see how they change, and we see that the price, the target price has now get has, has obtained a more narrow predictive distribution. And we can iterate this process until uh, we run out of a budget for collecting missing data, for example. Uh, yeah, you could be doing this, and uh, at the end, the remaining features, they are not very informative. Good. So you can test this on many different data sets and see how well your predictions improve as you collect data. We see our method here is called VIME. It's shown in red. Uh, this looks, I show the predictive error across different data sets and you see that as you collect data, you do better than other baselines. Um, and in general, we, we are doing uh, better than, than other similar techniques. Good. Um, this shows that this works in practice and it's actually better than other methods for working with missing data. You can get in it uh, better by using hierarchical VAEs. I said that hierarchical VAEs are better than normal VAEs. You can build a hierarchical VAE. Uh, in this case, uh, you won't be able to work with Gaussian encoders because computing this information gain, the mutual information between the missing feature and the target is not going to be possible. Um, but you can use uh, sampling-based methods, in particular something called Hamilton-Monte Carlo, and that works much uh, better than Gaussian uh, approximations, and you can compute the mutual information by using histograms, uh, as this one. You can now build a histogram between your predictions for the target variable of interest, y, and some missing variable, for example, x12 in this case. You have now a 2D histogram. Actually, with a 2D histogram, you can obtain very accurate estimates of mutual information. So you can do that. This is a scalable, I mean, it's not, it's not a scalable to high dimensions, but here you are working with pairs of random variables, and these are going to be scalars. Um, so you can uh, uh, use histograms to estimate mutual information. And you, saw, you see that the hierarchical method uh, with this sampling-based approach for estimating the mutual information is the green one. It, it works better than, than other techniques as well. So just uh, to conclude this part of the presentation, I have shown here how you can collect missing features using this information theoretic approach. For that, you use improved variation autoencoder mo models. They use these uh, uh, marginal uh, uh, autoencoders to Gaussianize your data. You can have uh, hierarchical VAs to improve performance. And uh, you can also use uh, Hamilton, Monte Carlo, and, and histograms to improve the the computation of this information gain, and we show that we are perform baselines here. Any questions on this part? Yes? Yeah, this, uh, we assume that the data here is missing at random. Uh, we don't do anything fancy about how the data is missing. Uh, there is work that builds on this that assumes uh, missing data that is not missing at random. You could have a missing data model, uh, that tells you when data is going to be missing or not, and you can combine it with this, and, and things will work better. Yes? That's right, so, yeah, why, why, I mean, your, as I understand your question is why do you need these hierarchical VAEs instead of the, the normal VAEs, is that right? Yeah, um, 
I'm probably not fully sure about that answer. I think empirically, uh, with these hierarchical BAEs, you can do things that you cannot do with normal BAEs. And I think one of the characteristics of BAEs is that they underfit. So if you have a BAE model, um, maybe because they are based on variational inference, and variational inference is a method that is well known to underfit, uh, if you fit that model to your data, you will, uh, for example, have uh, blurry images when you decode, um, and uh, you won't be able to to fit very well uh, particular data points. Um, with the hierarchical model, that doesn't happen. Uh, and I think one of the key things is that the encoder and the decoder, they share some parts. Let me see where is this. Uh, Yeah, so there are, there are parts that are shared in the encoder and the decoder. I think this helps to avoid uh, underfitting. So my answer would be probably underfitting is a big problem in BAEs, and these hierarchical models, they are less prone to underfitting. Good, in the interest of time, I'm going to move to the next part. Um, we are going to focus now on generative models of molecules that tell you how to synthesize those molecules. Um, there has been quite a lot of work recently, in the last years, about creating better and better generative models of molecules. The idea is that you train these models on existing databases of, of known molecules, and then you can generate synthetic molecules that have similar properties as those existing in the real world. And uh, some of them, they could have better properties than existing ones, and they could be interesting. The problem is that these models, they output molecules directly and they don't tell you how to synthesize the molecules. But what you may want is a model that generates the molecule and actually tells you how to synthesize the molecule. It may say, there is this uh, molecule in particular and it's the product of combining uh, two reactants. Uh, the advantage of using a generative model that generates molecules in this way is that the molecules are more likely to be synthesizable in practice. Many of these molecules here generated by these models, they actually may not be possible to synthesize. But this model already tells you how to synthesize the molecules. You have like this synthesis information right away, and the generated molecules, because they are built via chemical reactions, they are more likely to be realistic, to be feasible, and to be possible to exist in the real world. So how can we do that? What we propose is a generative model that generates uh, a directed acyclic graph, or DAC, that represents the synthesis of a particular molecule. We call this like synthesis DACs, and the idea here is shown here. This is uh, the synthesis graph for paracetamol. You start with some uh, building block molecules. These are already existing materials that could be purchased they already exist, and you're going to combine them to obtain some intermediate products, as these ones here, that you combine to obtain finally the product, which is uh, paracetamol. Um, it turns out that there are existing data sets of molecules, um, of, of, of uh, chemical reactions, and you can use those data sets to train a generative model that works in this way. Um, you have is a USPTO data set. It contains uh, chemical reaction data extracted from the uh, US Patent Office. These are patented chemical reactions. Um, and you can uh, uh, use that to train a model. For example, this data set has about 72,000 uh, synthesis graphs. These are graphs of molecular graphs. <laughs> because you have this kind of tree that tells you how the molecule is synthesized, but each node in the tree is a graph. It's a molecular graph. So we call this a uh, uh, um, directed acyclic graph of molecular graphs, um, and we call our model dog, because it's, it's going to be working with these uh, uh, DAGs of graphs. Anyway, let's have a look at how this works in practice. Uh, how you can actually generate these uh, th synthesis uh, DACs. Uh, you break them into their individual components. You are going to have now building block nodes shown in blue. 
and uh, intermediate products uh, or final ones shown in green. So we are going to start generating this sequentially with a recurrent neural network, which is going to be our generative model. We start always with an empty building block node. We are going to first choose one uh, element from our library of uh, purchasable molecules. We choose that element. And then based on that, we decide the next action. And the next action could be to add another building block node in our graph. And we're going to fill in, fill in that with another purchasable molecule. Then maybe our next action is to create an intermediate product node. And we're going to connect that to our previous nodes in our graph. For example, we decided to connect it to the first node that we introduced, and then to the second node. And then we decide to stop. At that point, we have created this intermediate product node. We know what are the reactants, the input to that node. There are these nodes connected to it. And then we just need to fill in its component. Our generative model is not going to be doing that because on the training data, you already have this, uh, this uh, product node. The, the data, the molecule that is in this position in the training data is already available, so we don't have to generate it. When we run our model, we'll have to generate the content of this. And for that, we're going to use a state-of-the-art methods for predicting the outcome of chemical reactions based also on generative models. You, you have something called the molecular transformer. This is a model that receives as input uh, reactants and it outputs the product. It's very similar to a, a language translation system, but operating on sequences of characters representing the molecules. And that uh, re works really well, and it can be used to fill in the content of these uh, nodes in green. But we continue generating our synthesis graph. We add another uh, empty building block node. We fill in its, its content. Then we add another intermediate product. We connect it to previous nodes in the graph, fill in its content, deciding to stop adding more arrows to the intermediate product node. We add another uh, building block node, its content, and then a final node, and we say this is the last one. So we connect any nodes that don't have any descendants in the graph with that one. Uh, and that's how our generative model works in this case. In the end, this is an autoregressive model. We generate the next action, the actions that I showed before. We're going to be choosing them based on the actions that we took in the past. And we implement this using a recurrent neural network that is going to use uh, embeddings of the uh, molecules that we are seeing given by graph neural networks. The whole thing is shown here. We are going to use uh, either a recurrent neural network or a variational encoder that uses as a decoder that recurrent neural network. The difference is whether you condition on some latent variables or not. We're going to assume this is an autoencoder model, so you have latent variables set that determine the hidden state of your recurrent neural network. The recurrent neural network receives as input the previous action to know what it did in the past. And that's used uh, to update its internal state. And then uh, it outputs a probability distribution over the purchasable products that you have available. This could be a large list of products. It could be on the hundreds of thousands of, of molecules that could be available. You choose one, and that's used to fill in your uh, building block node in the graph. You fill as an uh, input the embedding of the previous action. Then you choose to add another building block node or a product node. You choose the building block node, your DAG is updated as follows, and then you need to choose the content of that empty building block node, and obviously you don't choose the, the previous one, that's why this is maxed out, so you won't be sampling from this, this element. Your probability distribution is going to be given by a softmax layer, and, and that, that element that has already been, cho been chosen, you just don't uh, choose it again. And then you repeat the, the, the recurrent neural network basically outputs all these actions that I mentioned before. Um, I won't go much more into the details of this. Uh, 
as before, this recurrent neural network only constructs the nodes in the graph and the content of the product nodes, they are filled in by this molecular transformer. Um, any questions on this? Yes. That's right, so, yeah, what are, what are you generating? So you are generating this synthesis graph, and what you have to do is to uh, determine if you add a, a purchasable product node or an intermediate product node. When you have an intermediate product node, you are going to combine existing nodes in your graph and to get this intermediate product. Um, so you have to decide which of these nodes you connect to your intermediate product node. That's what we did here. Yeah, so you will have probabilities. So here, for example, you say, I'm going to add now uh, intermediate product node. Let me delete all this. So here I have the option to add an intermediate product node or a building block or a purchasable product node. I choose one, and then once I have chosen uh, a purchasable product, I have to choose the pur purchasable product. So I'm going to have as next step a probability distribution over purchasable products. I choose one, and I fill in the, the, the value of that node. My next node is actually an intermediate product. And then I have to decide which nodes I attach to those, to that, to that intermediate product node. And that's why you have here now a probability distribution over nodes that I have already constructed. These are previous nodes that I constructed. For example, I filled in this one, which is like a kind of triangle here. And this one, those are present here. So you just choose which ones to connect, but you can also stop. This is the, the stop. Uh, and whenever I have already connected something, that option is not available uh, again. So that's, that's basically how you construct this. Uh. Okay. So you can use this model to do molecule optimization. You fit it to an existing data set of molecules where you have uh, um, molecules and uh, properties. Then you can sample from the model and you get a distribution of uh, properties, values like that. This will be the distribution in the training data, and this is the distribution of properties in the molecules generated by the model. They are quite similar, but you can then take the top or best molecules, retrain the model on those, and repeat the process, and then you get another distribution of generated molecules with better properties, another one with uh, better properties, and so on, and then you could do this just to, to, to generate new molecules with improved properties. Uh, you can also use an autoencoder model, and it's going to map these synthesis graphs into some latent space. And points that are close to each other in the latent space, they have similar properties. And you can do interpolation of points in latent space, and you will do uh, interpolation in these synthesis graphs. You may have this synthesis graph, then you move to a nearby point in latent space, and you maybe get another synthesis graph that changes. Uh, when you decode, you get this thing that is similar to the other one, but it has like a different uh, building block node here. Uh, or this one, or this one. I know you can, you can just do interpolation between these, uh, these synthesis graphs. You can use this model to do molecule optimization, as I said before, and you can actually get similar results as with other generative models that don't work via chemical reactions. We don't really get better results here, but I mean, that's probably expected because uh, the other models, they are um, quite flexible as well. But when we look at the optimal molecules generated through the process that I mentioned before, uh, we find that uh, more molecules uh, are synthesizable according to a tool that tries to search for a synthesis of, of a particular molecule. So. To this tool, you give it a molecule and it's going to do an exhaustive search trying to see if it can synthesize, this, synthesize the molecule from existing products. Uh, 
And what we find that with our method, we get a higher uh, fraction of uh, optimized molecules that have uh, a synthesis root given by this tool. Our method also tells you the synthesis root, but at least we, we show here that you can actually find it with a, an independent tool. Uh, and then we, saw, we see also that our molecules, they have uh, uh, better properties. Uh, they pass some quality filters that other molecules don't uh, do, not do that, that molecules generated with other methods don't do, uh, because those methods, those molecules are generated just uh, in one shot. They are not generated by chemical reactions, and they are less likely to be uh, stable, for example. Good. So I have shown here this uh, model that generates uh, synthesizable molecules up front. It works by generating these synthesis graphs. Uh, we have shown that it, it's competitive in terms of uh, molecule generation and optimization, and it produces molecules with higher degrees of stability and synthesizability as well. Uh, yes. Yeah, you could train you could train this by reinforcement learning, but I mean we have already data with the actions, uh, so you don't need to do that. And for reinforcement learning, you will have some reward signals, and it's not super clear how to get those. I mean, you 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 have like data about um, reactions that work in the real world. You could do it by reinforcement learning, but you may have to see if a particular reaction works or not, and it would be. I mean, you will need to have like some signal, and that's not super. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could get the signal from the data, but it would be very similar to, to train by maximum likelihood, which is what we are doing. Uh, one more question, or? I think we didn't look into that. We didn't look in, into this uh, thing, but it was just looking if you can find some root. Um, yeah, we didn't look into this, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, good, we can move to the next part, and this is uh, how to create models that are robust. Uh, to spurious correlations. And uh, the idea is to combine these deep generative models now with ideas from causal inference. Um, what happens is that in many real world data sets, because of biases in the way the data is collected, you may have spurious correlations. Uh, this is an example where you could have those correlations. Imagine that you have a data set of uh, dogs and uh, husky dogs and wolves. And you may train a classifier that tries to predict whether the image has a husky dog or a wolf. And your classifier works extremely well on your training data. And then you test it on new data. And here you have a very clear image of a husky dog. And your classifier predicts it to be a wolf with high probability. And you're surprised why it's making this big mistake in this case. You then look at the explanation highlighting the pixels that are forcing the classifier to make its prediction, and you see that most of the pixels correspond to this white snow in the background, and you become very suspicious. What's going on? And you go to your training data, and you see that most of the images of wolves, they have the snow in the background. And actually, your classifier is working great on the training data, but it's just exploiting these spurious correlations between the background pixels. Most of the images of wolves have the snow in the background, and the classifier is just using that to make predictions. It's not using actually the shape of the animal to make the predictions, which are going to be the, the, causal, the causal variables, uh, would be those corresponding to the shape of the animal. And it's not using those. They are also correlated, but uh, the model is, is building on the spurious correlations. And ideally, you would like to avoid that in practice. Yes. Uh, it's related because here, what happens? We are going to <laughs> we are going to, to solve this problem. You are going to, to exploit these variabilities in the data, and what happens is that 
you can show that the true causal variables that uh, cause the target property, like the shape of the animal, uh, they are going to um, create predictors that don't change across domains. And what can happen is that in some domains, maybe you have these spurious correlations, but those you expect them to change across domains. Uh, and uh, if you build a predictor that is uh, robust, it should be stable across these domains. Uh, it's not exactly this thing of domain adaptation, but, but there are some connections there. Uh, you have the same with cows and camels. People have mentioned this example tons of times. And actually in healthcare, similar things happen. You may have data from a particular hospital, you train a predictor, it works great on the data from that hospital, and then you deploy it in a different hospital and it works awfully wrong. And it's because the, the predictor is building on these uh, spurious correlations. Uh, so you want to have methods that are robust to, to those. Uh, some methods address this problem, as I said before, by trying to, to find predictors that are robust and the, the performance doesn't change across domains. So you could have that uh, different data sets, maybe data sets from different hospitals or um, images taken by different people, for example, and you may have that these spurious correlations change slightly. For example, in the case of cows and camels, in that case you have correlations between the pixels in the background, maybe the, the cows have like a green background because they are more likely to be in a grass field, and the camels have more like a, um, um, a brown background because they could be in the desert. So your classifier could build on those background pixels, but if you have changes across uh, different data sets where the correlations between the background pixels change slightly, but the correlations between the causal features, between the, the shape of the animal don't change, you could be, use this to build the robust predictors. And this is what some method called invariant risk minimization does. Here we are going to do uh, something slightly different. Uh, we are going to try to find the true causal features and use those for predictions. Uh, invariant risk minimization tries to find a, a, a predictor that is invariant across this environment, and we are going to try to find the causal features directly and then use those for predictions. So our approach is as follows. We are going to receive as data input features and target properties. We are going to learn latent variables that explain how the data is generated. We are going to have a low number of these latent variables shown here in blue. And these latent variables are going to tell me the properties in the data. Maybe they are going, there is going to be a latent variable that tells me the background. The background is now green because you are in a field, or the background now is brown because you are in the desert. You may have also latent variables that determine the shape of the animal. One latent variable is going to say, oh, this is a cow, or, or this is a, a, a camel. So some variables are going to be causal, like these two, they cause the target property, shown in uh, yellow, but some latent variables are going to be spurious. They are going to be spuriously correlated with the target variable, and they are going to be effects of the target variable. And you could say that, oh, this is a picture of a cow, and because it's a cow, it's more likely that the background is green. And then the latent variable for the ba background would be an effect in this case. The latent variables obviously also determine the value of the pixels. And that's why you have now connections between them. So this shows the, the causal graph. Um, so now one way to solve this problem, avoiding the spurious correlations, is to estimate these latent variables, finding the causal ones, these two, predicting the value of the causal variables from the pixels, and then using the value of the causal variables to predict the target property. And in that case, you ignore the spurious variables. So the idea is to try to do causal inference not on the pixels themselves, because the pixels are high dimensional and they are not meaningful. It doesn't make sense to say, oh, this pixel causes the target property, or this pixel causes the, is an effect of the target property. You are not doing, we are not doing causal inference on the pixels themselves, but we are doing causal inference on the latent variables. And yes. It, you could imagine, yeah, so this would be the way the data is, is collected. 
you could say that so is i'm not saying that the the <coughs> <clears throat> you could, I mean, the, the idea here is how the data is collected. It could be that, for example, there is a person, and that person maybe is taking the photos and of the woods, and maybe that person lives in some place where there is a lot of the snow. Uh, so this this could be like um, this 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 connection between the target property and the data variable would represent that effect in how the, the data is collected. It's not really saying uh, that the actual class label is, is creating this. It's just capturing a, an, e an effect in, in how the data was collected. I hope that helps to clarify that. Uh, <clears throat> so it's just like a way of uh, representing these spurious variables uh, because of the bias in the, in the data collection process. <clears throat> now, let's see how we can solve this problem. To solve the problem, we need to first recover the latent variables and then find which ones are causal. How do you recover the latent variables? You use variational autoencoders, our favorite, our favorite uh, generative model. With one problem, variational autoencoders, if you train a variational autoencoder from data, you will get some latent variables. If you repeat the process with a different random seed, you will get completely different latent variables. This means that there is no hope in actually trying to do any causal inference, because you, can, you could recover arbitrary uh, nonlinear combinations of the actual original latent variables. These variational autoencoder models are said to be non identifiable because of that. So we need actually variational autoencoder models that guarantee identifiability of the latent variables. And it turns out that you have something called identifiable VAEs that have that property. Every time you train those models with different random seeds, you are guaranteed to recover the original latent variables that were used to generate the data. And we are going to use these models doing some extensions. Um, I won't go much into the details. You have to do some extensions to, to get this to work well in practice. Uh, but the idea is like this. We are going to also work with environments. You are going to have data, data sets collected under different conditions. This could be data from different hospitals. Uh, different data sets of images, uh, and so on. And we have the following generative model. You have an environment variable. You have some uh, causal latent variables that are affected by the environment, and they cause the target property Y here. This would be the, the target property. And then you have the spurious latent variables that are effects of the latent variable. This is the model that we work with, and we are going to assume uh, that it's, sorry, and the, the latent variables obviously generate the observed pixels x here. Um, we are going to assume that the, this model is an identifiable VAE with some uh, prior that has dependencies. You need to have dependencies because here you have, you are, con you are conditioning on the target property y, and that's going to introduce dependencies among its causal variables. I won't go much into the details, but the idea is that we, you have now a variational autoencoder model with a prior that introduces dependencies as a function of y. And it depends also on the environment. And this is going to guarantee that we can recover the ground truth latent variables. Uh, I'm going to skip this. We can see how this works in practice. We have some original latent variables shown here, they are generated from different environments. Each color is a different environment. If you uh, generate data with this model and then train a VAE and recover the latent variables, you get this, these latent variables. They are all mixed. And the reason is that the latent variables are not identifiable. Every time you train the model, you will get different values, and uh, they, they are going to be transformed in a nonlinear way, in a complicated way. Our model is this one. It can recover the latent variables up to simple transformations like scalings, um, um, uh, multiplication by a negative number, or things like that, permutations. But um, we see that we are able to uh, separate them 
in a similar way as, as how they were obtained in, 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 the, the way that it, in the way they were generated. Um, this shows the recovery of the latent variables with our model, and we see that we can recover much better than with the uh, VAEs, for example, and other models. And then, uh, I mean, this, this completes the first part. We are, we are able to recover the latent variables. Now, you need to find which ones are causing the target property. And to do that, we propose a simple method for this <coughs> by looking at pairs of causal, or pairs of latent variables. <coughs> if you have two latent variables, either both are causes, both are effects, or one is a cause and the other one is an effect. And it turns out that when you condition on Y, only in this case, conditioning on Y, observing Y means that these two variables become dependent. This is a property of um, probability distributions. You have a probability distribution uh, with this type of uh, connection where XJ and XI generate Y. If you condition on Y, these two variables become dependent. Uh, this is as simple as in a linear model. Imagine that you have a linear model for y, and I tell you what is the value of y, then I cannot change these two variables in an arbitrary way. Imagine that this is a straight line. I tell you the value, imagine that the... Maybe with a plane... I, I, I won't draw it because it's hard to see, but... Imagine that you just have like a linear model, and it's a linear model. Why is a linear mo combination of x, j, and x, i? If I tell you the value of y, I cannot change the values of x, i, and x, j in an arbitrary way, because they have to fit y. So that's the idea here. So you can then find the causal variables by doing independence tests. You can condition on y and see if you have dependencies, and if, if you have dependencies, the two latent variables are causes. And if not, uh, they are either one is a cause and the other one is effect. So you can look at all the pairs <coughs> and you will get a few pairs for which you have dependencies when you condition on Y and those are causes. And that's what we do to identify the causal variables. So we have already identified the causal variables and to learn our robust predictor, we just predict the causal variables from the pixels and then once we have the causal variables, we predict from them the target property. So this would be, in the case of the cows and the camels, you would have latent variables that determine the shape of the animal. You predict those from the pixels and you only use the pixels that have the shape of the animal. And once you have the value of those latent variables, you can predict from them the target property. And you get like a robust uh, predictor in that way. I'm going to show you how this works on a simple benchmark, which is called colored MNIST. It's MNIST where you have to distinguish between uh, digits. You, you, you binarize the problem, so you classify a thing from zero to four, and from five to nine, you have only two categories. But the color of the, the digits is highly correlated with the class label. So you have spurious correlations between the color and the class label. And at test time, the color is anti-correlated with the class label. So if you have a classifier that uses the color to make predictions instead of the shape of the digit, it's going to do awfully at test time in this data set. And that's why typical methods, they will fail with a 10% accuracy only um, because they build on the spurious correlations. Our model actually outperforms other baselines and it works as uh, well, almost as well as a ground truth model that doesn't see the color of the digits. You can see the latent variables that we identify as spurious and the ones that we identify as causal. And when you change a causal latent variable, the shape of your digit changes. When you change the value of a spurious uh, latent variable, which is an effect, the color of the digit changes, but the shape doesn't change much. So we are able to separate these latent variables between ones that are causal and determine the shape of the digit, 
and ones that are spurious and determine the color. You can do the same with other data sets and uh, we obtain also good results. Um, so yeah, maybe just to conclude this part, uh, do we have any questions on this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, what do you need for this to work well in practice? You need enough data to train these deep generative models. So if you have uh, data points that could be high dimensional, uh, but you don't have enough data to learn a good uh, autoencoder model, then this thing is not going to work. So you need uh, large amounts of data. You need basically generative models that are good, that can generate data that looks similar to the original one. And if you don't have a lot of data points, then you're going to run into problems. The other thing is that you need to look at pairs of latent variables. And this means that you cannot have a huge number of latent variables. This is going to work between maybe up to maybe 50 latent variables or so, but as soon, as soon as you have more, then you will run into problems. The pairs, you only need to do it once, and you can parallelize that, uh, but it's a, a, a part that is expensive as well. Um, yeah, so that's basically the, the main thing for this to, to work. Um, good, in the interest of time, I'm going to briefly describe the, the next uh, part which is uh, on using now generative models to approximate these Bothman distributions of molecules. Molecules are actually not rigid. You have that the atoms, they are actually oscillating and vibrating and they can occupy different positions in space. And uh, looking at how the, these atoms occupy different positions in space can be very useful. Uh, the location of the atoms is going to be given by this Bothman distribution. It's the probability distribution that, that determines where they can be found. And this can be very useful for uh, drug discovery, for example. You may want to know if a particular molecule binds to a target protein. There is a, an example of this. There is a company called the Shaw Research that do very expensive simulations based on uh, molecular dynamics, Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques to uh, sample from these distributions. And you can see some cool animations that they have in their website. For example, here you have a, uh, uh, I think this is probably a protein shown in, in white, and then you have a drug-like molecule, and you see how they are like uh, taking different positions, the atoms, and you can see that this drug-like molecule is, is, for example, quite likely uh, found in this region, which could be like a target site that you want to, uh, to inhibit, for example. Um, so this simulation was generated uh, using a lot of compute. You need to run these uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques for very long to generate these samples. And the question is, can you avoid this? Can you just uh, train a deep generative model that approximates the distribution and generates independent samples? And that's what we are going to do with normalizing flows. So going back to the presentation, we're interested in approximating these Boltzmann distributions. They are determined by the energy the energy can be obtained with numerical approximations that could be relatively cheap, but then sampling from these Boltzmann distributions is very complicated, in particular because you have many different multiple modes. Uh, the, the target protein there could be in different locations, and those are going to be different modes in your probability. No? So if you see the animation, you are going to have a mode here, but then you may have other modes in other regions, maybe in this, in this part or, or somewhere else. So these distributions have multiple modes, and it's, it's hard to deal with that. So the current approach is to do expensive simulations based on uh, molecular dynamics methods. This generates correlated samples, and it, they are slow. And we are going to use uh, normalizing flows to approximate the distribution. You are going to have a Gaussian as input, and your normalizing flow is going to generate a complicated distribution that determines the locations of the atoms in space. Um, how do you fit the normalizing flow? In this case, you don't have access to samples. You don't have access to data. You only have access to energy values, to the log probability of the Boltzmann distribution. Um, you could do uh, variational inference. You could minimize the Kullback-Lyber divergence 
between the Boltzmann distribution P and the normalizing flow Q. That's tractable. You only need to sample from your flow here and evaluate the density ratio between the Boltzmann distribution and the flow, and this is fine. Uh, you could do that, but the result is that many of your models are missed. If you fit a target probability like the one shown with the contours that has multiple modes, and you fit a normalizing flow, this uh, pullback library divergence is usually focusing on modes. If you fit well some modes, you're going to have low values of the divergence, basically because the divergence is the log density ratio, which is the error, but weighted by the uh, flow distribution. So if the flow distribution is low in some regions, like this, here the flow distribution is very low, the error in this part, you don't care about it because the probability that Q samples there is very low. So that favors the flow to ignore modes and we want to avoid that. So I will describe briefly some ideas here. What we do is a, a new way to train flows to approximate this Boltzmann distribution. And what we do is instead of minimizing the pullback library divergence, we minimize call, something called the alpha divergence. The alpha divergence is going to be mass covering. It's going to favor covering different modes instead of focusing on, on only a few modes. Uh, for different values of alpha, this alpha divergence actually is either mode seeking or mass covering, and we're going to la use large values of alpha, like these ones, and we try to cover multiple modes. Uh, you can also show that this alpha divergence minimizes the balance of importance sampling weights. The important sampling weights is this density ratio, and important sampling is, good in, is important in this context because if you have a normalizing flow, you can generate samples from your flow. Those samples are going to be biased because your flow is an approximation. But you can de-bias those samples by reweighting them using these important sampling weights. So that's something that could be useful to improve the quality of your samples. But sometimes you have high variance in these important sampling weights and that's something that you want to avoid. But by minimizing this alpha divergence, you minimize the balance in these important sampling weights. So we minimize the alpha divergence with alpha equal to two, which is mass covering and minimizes balance in important sampling weights. And uh, we feed the flow as follows. We have the flow, we generate samples from the flow, we then, then run an important sampling, which generates improved samples with respect to the target, and then we use those improved samples to estimate the alpha divergence.